James, I think you have the sign up sheets for me. Yeah. Sometime tonight, just so you, you know, before you get a record of who came and we have a, an idea of uh, who to ask or, or uh, allow you to ask any questions afterwards, and we'll have uh, a little bit of uh, some organization to it. Uh, for housekeeping outside the door and all the way to the left are the turkey fountains to get thirsty at some point. Let's have some ice out there. Uh, restrooms are out this door and to the right and around the corner if you need to have a break that way. The, the goal is to break at, at about an hour. Uh, there's two parts to this. And uh, hopefully, in about an hour, we're going to be done with this and we'll do a 10 minute break and some, hopefully have some time for some uh, QA. And then we'll get into the next section and uh, we'll follow that with another QA before we get out of here. So welcome. I appreciate y'all coming out. And uh, uh, this is a subject that's really exciting for me. I've been into it for uh, over three years, almost four years now. So uh, as far as Bitcoin and blockchain stuff, I'm you know I'm one of the old timers, right? As, you, as a lot of you know, this change is so fast that that's uh, that's ancient history. <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today, uh, is when I start having conversations with people about Bitcoin and blockchain first stumbling block I ran into was people don't know what money is. They know about how it gets to their wallet, they know they get a paycheck, but they don't know where it comes from um, before that. Uh, one of the speakers I listened to says, you know, you start having a child to ask you, you know, mom, where's money come from? And Well, it comes from, you know, the bank. Where'd they get it? Well, they uh, got it from their bank. Well, where'd they? Well, stop asking questions. <laughs> they don't really know after that. <clears throat> So uh, this is just a quick rundown of what we're uh, going to go over. I changed these as I start filling in all the details as I put the, the all the product together. So uh, when I sent out this originally to some of the folks, this has changed a bit since then as I start filling in the framework and getting to more details. We're going to talk about the first uses of money. We're going to talk about the birth of banking. Sticks and stones for money. They break your bones, but they were also used as money. The birth of the... Uh, fractional reserve banking, history of paper currencies, separating the fact and fiction, or we went from bootstrap to gold to nothing now. We're going to compare all kinds of types of money and decide which is best. And can two monies be complementary to each other? We're going to talk about the fate of fiat in history. It's a monetary theory. A lot of people don't realize money is a grand <coughs> illusion. It's a shared hallucination. The birth and death of money and the day money almost died. And we'll follow that with the day the world changed. The following the day almost died. Is there a Chevy to the levy or something? <laughs> we can find a Chevy to the levy if we really try. So a little bit about me. I'm Mark Reese. I've spent about 30 years in information technology. I work here at Intermountain Healthcare, but I'm here on my own behalf. I'm not re representing Intermountain Healthcare. They've been generous to let me use the facilities and the WebEx uh, equipment, but um, this is here uh, on my own, just so you don't have any confusion of um, in around healthcare's involvement at this point. I have been a writer for Bitcoin Magazine. I wrote uh, fairly heavily in 2014, about 50 articles between that and some other freelance work I've done. I'm part of the Salt Lake uh, Bitcoin Meetup Group. Um, I work with uh, Will, so they're in charge there, but I'm one of the um, leaders on that group as well. And everybody likes to know something about you know, something personal that's not just me and Bitcoin and blockchain. So the personal thing about me is I love Indian motorcycles, as you can see of me <laughs> on my Indian motorcycle. Well, one little claim to fame that I have is one of my articles I wrote for Bitcoin Magazine. They decided to make the lead article of the entire issue, and uh, this become a little bit historic. This was right before Mount Gox blew up. Mount Gox being the biggest exchange that lost uh, three or four hundred million dollars of people's Bitcoin money because they didn't take care of it. They were they were a, a, an exchange that were was built to house Magic the Gathering online exchange, kids games, and Bitcoins were pennies. And they thought, well, maybe we can just use this as some kind of online thing, whatever. They didn't have any security. It was run by amateurs. All of a sudden, Bitcoin price explodes. They get hacked. They're gone. But I was warning people about this. I said, no, you're changes. You're, you guys are getting gold fever, and you're just throwing your money at this stuff, trying to get rich, but no one's doing any background. So I did a bunch of background, huge report on this. They, uh, they liked it in the magazine. And my claim to fame is now the Smithsonian Institute has a, a section on money, in the past, the present, and future, and they've selected my magazine to represent uh, Bitcoin in the Smithsonian Institute. So that's funny. 
All right, here we have some Cassius coins. That those were um, developed by a guy, Mike uh, Caldwell, in Salt Lake. So we have two Salt Lake people represented here in the Smithsonian Institute. <clears throat> Can I? Yes. Good question. Salt Lake. There was a map showing where people are talking about Bitcoin, and Salt Lake is seriously on that map. Not being done. So I would. That's right. In that state, but you just. Salt Lake in California, southern uh, Idaho, southern. Uh, so he's saying uh, our gentleman in our, in our audience here is saying those Salt Lake and what are showing up uh, heavily on the maps for high activity for people that are involved with Bitcoin um, near California and I know there's New, New, New York. There's there's places spherically around the world that are, are big into it, but uh, Salt Lake will is well represented with Overstock.com. They're one of the, the first big people, players in uh, using Bitcoin as they dedicated themselves to taking them. So let's talk about money a little bit. What are all the things here on the bottom? Cigarettes, salt, tobacco leaves. Those are shells and gold and silver. What do they have in common? Sure. Well, they were all money. I guess I gave that away. We have six attributes of money. These are common to recognize throughout history. It has to be recognizable. It has to be portable, it's divisible, rare, it has to be durable, and fungible. Does everybody know what fungible means? That's the one that trips some people up. If I pull a dollar out of my bill and you put a dollar out of your bill, they're the worth a dollar. They're the same. Um, some kinds of money, you might have cigarettes, for example, that might be wet or whatever, and you're not going to trade one cigarette for another, not as fungible as a dollar. There are three functions of money. The main functions that are recognized, it has to be a store of value. You have to have trust that if you give somebody a, a piece of currency that it will maintain some kind of value if it's exchanged back to you in a day or a week or month. Can I stop you for a second? Okay, I'm sorry, comment. Uh, this is an archaic model of what money is. I know that of the last century and so This is not a, a modern systems theoretical approach towards what money is and what it serves. This is, this is the last century's model. Okay. He, meant, he mentioned this is a, an older version of what money is, the conceptual of money is. Great. Okay. This is historical accounts. Uh, money also means that the function has to be a unit of account. That means if the, the beads were a great example of a unit of account, they all had different representations, one, two, three, four. And, uh, you know, being able to numberize those and have a consistency with the numbering system is, is important. And it has to be a medium of exchange. If I give you my dirty socks, you know, somebody might take those, but it has to be a common medium of exchange. If you can't trade my dirty socks to somebody else for the next item on the list, then it's not a very good function, it's not a very good currency. <clears throat> sticks and stones can break your bones, but they were also used as money. For an example, these are tally sticks. These were used in medieval Europe for hundreds of years, even into the early 1700s, 1800s. Uh, they, some of our terms that we use for money and, and for other terms actually derived from tally sticks. When you hear someone say, tally it up, that was derived from tally sticks. You hear, what's the tally, boys? They were referring to tally sticks. And the stockholder, those were separated into two. The larger of the two sticks that were key to go together was the stockholder, and he held, held the debt that you, the other person was required to pay back. And these little notches and marks were lined up with the stock piece, so we knew exactly how much was still owed. And those were notched off and keyed separately. So this was a valid form of money for hundreds of years and successful. What about stones? These are raw stones, and also incidentally, Possibly the first public ledger that we'll talk about later. Bitcoin is a public ledger. Uh, raw stones were actually distributed knowledge as well. They were used for 500 to 1500 AD throughout the islands, Pacific islands. Uh, they were almost never moved, rarely moved locations. Only the ownership records were kept separate on a public ledger that they memorized. And every <laughs> there was one that actually fell into the ocean as they were trying to cross the harbor after they created one, it was never seen again, but they still use that as an account of money. People still owned it and they kept, they agreed, okay, well, we know it's still there, even though they couldn't see it, 
They still counted it as money in their ledger system. The birth of the banking system. Well, goldsmiths were actually the first people that, that kept the value for, for people. They would smith the coins, and as it turns out, if you start giving gold to people around the village, it gets stolen. And the only person that seemed to have the safe enough place to keep the gold was the goldsmith himself. He had the vaults and the security for it. So eventually, they decided, you know what, let's just keep it with the goldsmith. He would give them a little receipts for their gold. And uh, they felt better about that. And eventually, they started to use these receipts for the gold and trade their receipts for each other. The goldsmiths had good reputations. If they did, they'd start marking their coins with their uh, insignia on it. Eventually, they stored them on behalf of people. And the, the goldsmiths become essentially the first bankers. Here's an example of the kind of, uh, they get fancy or fancy, the receipts for the, the kinds of money that they would have on deposit for them. And it would become what they called a bearer bond. Whoever held that receipt had claim to the gold that that represented. Uh, at, at the goldsmith and the bank. Then, because of this, uh, uh, the goldsmiths eventually decided that they found that rarely did anybody come in and want all their gold. It was heavy, they get robbed, and uh, as it starts to pile up and people just was happy to trade receipts back and forth, they started to realize, you know, I could give probably two or three receipts for the same piece of gold because what are the odds that two or three people are going to come in and want this piece of gold all at the same time? And that grew and grew and grew, and and eventually they they come out with some formulas and says, really, you know, I could probably do uh, you know ten to one. I could get ten receipts as long as I don't get ten people in there. That become what essentially was the fractional reserve banking, and it still carries on. Um, that really made the goldsmiths rich because all of a sudden they had invisible gold. They were issuing receipts and getting credit for this, and people were paying them for this service. Not realizing that they also their neighbors were also paying for that same service, and the goldsmith and bankers become really rich off this because they were issuing essentially fake money. How about the first paper currencies? Pick the first paper currency that they realized came from China. They called they nicknamed it the Chinese flying money. The word fiat represents printed money, basically. It's a, a fiat is a, an order. Let it be done. It's derived from I believe Latin, and that's when a ruler will tell you, we expect you to take this as money, we've issued it, and uh, this is going to be redeemable for the debts of the country. And for legal systems, if, uh, if you have some kind of claim in the legal court system, this will settle those debts. Uh, but it's dangerous because of that, because it gives the government that prints this money the monopoly. And uh, of course, having monopoly power for money is money over your people gives you enormous amounts of power. But the difference between money and currency, one of the most important differences you'll recognize is a currency will lose its value with the word. Money does not. Money like gold or silver will retain its value no matter where you're at in the world. So if people ask you about the difference between money and currency, that's one of the main ones. Currency loses its value at the border. So we talked about the, the, the first money. This was China's money, the flying, the, uh, the flying money in 1024 AD. So it's pretty pretty old. They were. I'm surprised there was actually any remaining from, from that old. This also has the distinction of being the first that happens to every fiat currency eventually. It goes to zero value, hyperinflated away. This was discovered by Marco Polo, Marco Polo that was there. He said the best families in the empire were ruined. A new set of men came in to, to control public affairs, and the country became the scene of welfare and confusion. How about the United States? A lot of people don't know this. We had our first currency. The Continental also was ruined by hyperinflation. Around the time of the Revolutionary War, the common phrase at that point, after people were burned and their, their life savings was destroyed by this, was it isn't worth a continental. That was a common phrase that they used for even 100 years after no one had seen the continental before. This was used, generally what happens in a, in a currency that hyperinflates away, war is the most common reason that they 
they get destroyed. And, and these were printed to abandon to pay for the Revolutionary War until the point that uh, no one took them anymore. So we have we talked about the different types and categories that make money recognizable and their uses. So this is a comparison chart we can just go over real quick. We talked about tobacco and does it meet all the criteria? Well, yeah, X's mean yes and, and question marks, you know, that's questionable. Tobacco rare, well, you grow a whole bunch of it. No one really had an accounting system for it. The salt, you know, that was pretty good. That was really popular in a lot of places, but what happens if it gets wet? And what happens if people eat it? Eating a currency is deflationary, <laughs> and you probably want to keep those separate. There, a lot of people think, well, you can't eat gold or you can't eat dollars. Well, yeah, you probably don't want to eat. <laughs> Have you ever played M and M's or uh, poker with M and M's, and you see your uh, jackpot going <laughs> slowly fading away? Uh, deflationary currency. Yeah, you you want to keep your money and your food different. Seashells. We saw that the the wampa that was used in uh, North America extensively. They saw these uh, these little beads make it clear into the plain states. So that was a very popular for you know hundreds of years. Of course, we know gold and silver, that's the, the, the popular. And you notice this meets every criteria along the list, medium exchange, unit of account, uh, all the recognizable functions. That's historically been the best form of money that we've found so far. And then we have our, our paper, and they're really tokens, paper token currency. And you see that those meet a lot of the, the criteria. but. Are they rare? If you can just print those anytime you want, they can be rare. But usually, what has happened throughout history is eventually they're not rare. As people, as governments get themselves into debt and want to stay in power and keep people happy, they print these things off until they're not worth anything anymore. And are, are paper currencies durable? You know, not really. They'll, they'll last a year or so, but they're they have to keep reprinting. And I, I used to. Uh, no, a person that worked at a, well, a, a Federal Reserve agency here in Salt Lake that was in charge of destroying old money. They were torn, and they eventually get to a point where they have to replace them. And they had to basically get frisked down to almost nothing to walk into these buildings and burn the stuff up and huge inventory and security guards and, and then walk out. And, and so an interesting job making sure that they destroyed money, paper money, and then replace it with the exact denominations and whatnot with the brand new bills as they burned the old stuff. What about Bitcoin, the whole, the newest generation of money? Does it meet all the criteria? Well, surprisingly, it meets the criteria of almost all of these really well. Only maybe second to gold and silver in the one category. Is, it, is there a demand for it, and is it recognizable? Well, you can say it's recognizable because you can't counterfeit it. But is there a demand for it? Well, in relative terms to the rest of the world, no. It's, it's microscopic. There's uh, almost no demand yet, but it's a baby currency. Why create Bitcoin? Well, we talked a little bit about the fate of currencies. A study was done, the Global Research Center, that says they've said 775 different currencies. And of those, the average lifespan of a currency, a paper currency, your government created fiat, is to only 27 years. We had stats on the war took out 21%. Monetary reform, they decided the money wasn't good enough. And like uh, you see in Venezuela and India, we're going to expire your old money and we're going to create a new money. You know, you get rid of your red ones and now we're going with green ones. Zimbabwe even had expiration dates on their money. They would issue the, their largest bill at the end before they finally gave up was $100 trillion. And when, as they issued money, they put expiration dates on it. It was completely invalid in six months. So it forced people to have to rechange their money and, and of course they were worthless by then anyway. Why create money? Why not just trust our government? Well, let's look at our, gold, our global money supply. We talked about the need for a currency or a money to be rare. And you see throughout the years, even you know, in the recent years, since 1988, what happened, it, we stayed fairly steady until 2000. We had a dot-com crash and they rushed in a whole bunch of money as companies went out of business and their debts couldn't be repaid. Money is based on debt, so they had to throw a whole bunch of money into the system to paper over the crater debt that happened. Alan Greenspan was our buddy, right? All these created the next boom, you know, that went into the 2008 banking crisis. That was fueled by people that got all this easy credit to go, you know, for their houses. Why did they get this easy money? Well, the banks were flush with money, and they're like, well, geez, 
we got to do something with this. It's just sitting in the back room here. So let's just start giving them, you know, to the people that maybe didn't, wasn't qualified for it. And you see what happened afterwards after the banking crisis. It's just gone skyrocket. That's not good signs. And uh, people that create money are aware of this, especially people that are not fans of fiat currency and know their history. They see this as big red warning signs. Let's talk about reserve currency because the United States has the extraordinary privilege of giving us the reserve currency right now. That means we can print off a lot and we don't see the dangerous effects of that right off because the rest of the world uses our currency. All the oil and gold, most of the commodities in the world are priced in dollars. That means if they want to trade between countries, they have to buy American dollars to make, complete those trades. They can't they don't just trade Chinese yuan with you know, a euro, well, I think euro's kind of becoming a little bit of a reserve currency, but all there's 180 different currencies and most of them will trade with each other without American dollars in between. So that gives us enormous, enormous privilege. But you see, this doesn't last long. Portugal, Spain, going back to the 1400s, they all had a nice spell at it. And as one leaves, the other one takes over. And eventually through war or hyperinflation, nobody trusts that, that, that currency anymore and they lose that privilege. United States is up there, and if you kind of measure the, the widths of these historically, you'll see that we're kind of getting up there to sort of an average lifespan of where we would see us lose the reserve currency status, and who knows where it goes from there. So, where does your money come from? We talked about this a little bit. There's two sources of money, and people kind of understand maybe one, but they don't really get the second. First is your bank. Money is based on debt. Your bank gives you a loan. They don't really have the money there. They're not. It's not like Joe came in and, and gave them a big deposit of you know a thousand bucks, and they're sitting on a thousand bucks saying, "All right, well here's Joe's money." No, they give you a loan, and they create on their books that you you're basically paying your future income to pay now. You're basically borrowing it from the future rather than from John. So what happens is they you give them an IOU, you're going to pay that back, and they take that IOU. Say we, well, I copied a twenty dollar bill there, but let's collect twenty thousand. And they say, all right, well, we got, to, we really only got you know your your deposit of you know two hundred bucks, but we're going to call that on our books two hundred thousand dollars that we have. They don't show what's in the cash receipt, well, they show that as cash. And what do they do with that cash? Well, fractional reserve banking. They are allowed under the government to be able to expand that by, for you know, one dollar they can create nine more just like that to give out in new loans. So your little bit of a deposit that creates the seed to create nine more just like it that they can also then go lend out and say they send that to somebody else that uses that the, you know the two hundred thousand dollars to go buy a car and buy some lawn equipment and a shed. Each one of these becomes the seed for another nine bills, each one. Can we predict what happens in the future as this expands further and further and further? Now, we remember this was very shallow. He gave only 10% down. Each of these only have 10% down. So that means it's gone by nine, you know, 900%, uh, by another 900% the next time, by another 900%. What happens if something goes wrong? Donald Trump comes and starts firing people for not building the wall or whatever. Well, Joe can't pay for his house anymore. That loan goes bad. Remember what we said about debt? Debt and money are the same thing. That means that money just evaporated that was being supported by that debt. What happens when that money evaporates? What happened to everything that was chained on top of that being the seed? Well, that bank can't make its payments because the money that they were counting on the bank accounts isn't there anymore, which means the money that they were lending to the other banks for the truck now can't make their debts, and on and on and on it goes. We have a, a house of cards with our money system right now with fractional reserve banking because they consider debt and cash to be the same thing. So when one bank goes, the bigger banks go, the lenders, the home builders, the markets. This is what we saw happening as contagion is the banks all owe each other money and owe each other debt. So the second source of money, where does it come from? Well, the Federal Reserve itself. The Federal Reserve creates bonds 
40 year bonds or 50 year bonds or whatever. And the, the Federal Reserve creates that money for them and lends it to them. Good old Federal Reserve. And, you, and there's a lot of people that say, well, why don't we audit the Fed? How, how long have they been doing this? How much is on the books? Who's been doing this? And they've never been audited. They won't allow themselves to be audited. Good old Federal Reserve. <coughs> and how do they make money? It's just a couple of uh, digital inputs that add a couple of little zeros at the end of a couple of little decimal places, and they got a special magic button. Right out of thin air. Can I stop you again for a second? This leads into some legal theory, and uh, there are some people in town who are very versed with the legal theories involved with this. Uh, we have uh, lots of little uh, legal connections, like the Banking Emergency Act of 1933, uh, <clears throat> and so on. And uh, what, what makes money is a legal, a legal question. Okay, so he brings up a, a point that money is a, a, is a legal question. And there's, there's a lot of formulas and there's a lot of politics that go on beyond the scenes. Um, if you, a lot of you, I sent out an email a week or two ago for the people that signed up early that talks about one of the videos I had linked and recommended that you watch, how, it was a How Money Is Made video that talks about this extensively. I really recommend that you watch that video. It was eye-opening how the Treasury and the Federal Reserve bundle their knowledge together behind, behind closed doors without minutes and notes, without oversight, and create money to lend. One, one creates the money and lends the other. The other one pays it back at interest. Uh, just out of thin air. Well, they, they have excuses. That their, their primary current excuses at the moment is your birth certificate. Your, your birth certificate is the promise that you will pay this giant debt that they keep creating. That, that's what the legal people say. I've been them around them talking about it, this, this issue. Uh, when they sign your birth, that's uh, it's a receipt. Your birth certificate is actually in the format of a warehouse receipt. And it, it's absolutely connected to the creation of fiat of the United States. Okay. So we have money raining from heaven that was created out of thin air. Well, who gets that money? The Federal Reserve has special relationships with the uh, two big to fail banks, including Goldman Sachs. There are, uh, there's a list, I think, of a dozen. They get that money that, uh, and from what I understand, they almost have to force it. They, they don't may even actually need the money. If people aren't asking for loans, if the economy's bad, if people don't have jobs, they're not asking for loans. But yet the Federal Reserve has to, they call it the term is pushing on a string. They try to force feed this money into these banks. They don't want it necessarily, so the banks themselves aren't really going to be lending it out to people who don't ask for it. So they have special ways and places to put that money. Scary places. They do probably the most scary gambling in the world, and we'll talk about why. Very risky bets. They put it in, and what got us into trouble is, and you probably remember with Lehman Brothers, this is another one of the videos that I recommended that you watch, the fail of Lehman Brothers. Where did its money go? Well, most of it went to over-the-counter derivatives. And if you watch the movie The Big Short, you kind of you had an idea of what those are. Those are bets that they're playing on uh, interest rates or insurance. And how big is the amount of money that they make on these bets? Here's the total global supply of the entire world of money right now. M2 money supply. It's around 77, 80 trillion dollars. The current outstanding notional value of all of the, the bets right now, according to the International Banking, uh, International Bank of Settlements, is over 280 trillion dollars right now. That means if these bets go bad, they take out the entire world money supply four times over. Yeah. So they they were built with good intentions. Yes. Blythe Masters from J.P. Morgan's is a, a, one of the creators that, of a lot of these things. They're fairly recent. They were within the last twenty years that you'll get that. The problem is you'll get bets on top of bets on top of bets on top of bets, like you saw in the Big Short. If you watch that, 
couple people at the poker table or blackjack table in the movie make a bet and then people watching the game on the side say you know what i'll bet that person wins and they'll let even bigger money they'll play odds on it and then the people saw the people making the bets on the side says i'll bet that person on the side wins and they start making bets on top of bets on top of bets and pretty soon the little poker bet in the middle exactly. become just a tiny little seed compared to the 500 times of bets that went on beyond it. So one little That's tiny exciting. change at the poker table can have huge mag uh, magnified effects through the ripples. So people know about this, some of the right people that, the, that keep track of this. This is from Forbes, big banks and derivatives, why another financial crisis is inve inevitable. So let's talk about Henry Paulson. I don't know how close, if you've read his book or if you've heard some of the transcripts of what happened when he asked for TARP when he went into Congress that day. If you watch the movie Too Big to Fail, which is another video that I recommended at the email that I sent you, know, this will talks about it a little bit. You watch him go in with uh, Henry Paulson, went in with Tim, uh, the uh, Treasury Secretary, uh, Tim Geithner. Geithner? Yeah. Uh, where they went begging on their hands and knees to Nancy Pelosi and the Congress, people that were in charge of the committee to say, we've got to have this tarp bill, things are bad, you don't even know how bad they are. So in dramatic fashion, fashion. at 10 a.m. they walk into the Congress, this is, this is a, it, it illustrated in his book, the Secretary Henry Paulson and Federal Reserve Ben Bernanke call emergency meeting with key members of the U.S. Congress. Paulson advises, due to ongoing bank runs between the world's largest banks, the entire U.S. banking system will run out of liquid cash within three days. This will cause the entire U.S. banking system to crash. He further advises, within 24 hours of that, the systemic contagion ripple will topple most government central banks around the world. This makes most governments insolvent. He painted the picture. ATMs will run out of cash within hours. Grocery stores will be empty by that evening, and they prepared to call out the National Guard. They spoke of a nationwide call for martial law to stem the food riots and the looting and panic that were sure to come. This had their attention. He then presented a three-page document we know now as TARP to Congress to sign. He gave himself un- Precedent and emergency powers to do whatever was necessary to keep the banks afloat. The Fed secretly began flooding banks around the world, not just the United States, with newly quote unquote printed cash. By some accounts, by the technical people that were behind the scenes that had to make sure this got to the banks, we were we were within hours of a complete meltdown. We were at a rager's edge of life on our planet being completely altered. This was the day that money almost died. About six weeks later, Halloween night, on an obscure mailing list that was dedicated to uh, the world of cryptography, cyberpunks to be uh, exact, a mysterious post quietly appeared from a previously unknown source. He called himself Satoshi Nakamoto. He gave them an academic white paper titled Bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. This was destined to change the world. So, uh, this, these are the links I gave you on your email earlier. Uh, you'll get a copy of this. I'll, I'll make sure that you'll have a link to the copy of the, the PDF here. So you'll be able to have, we'll have these links again for those. A lot of people signed up after I sent out that email. So uh, this will be hopefully good news for you. Uh, these are interesting, all super interesting shows that I found at least hope that some of you, I had some comments from some of you that had, uh, that wa had watched these and these were new to you. So uh, hopefully you find them as interesting as I did. And that is the end of our first part, which was a good time because we've been at it for about an hour. You guys probably need to get up and take a break for a few minutes. So.